Okay, well, so the good news is you don't know it, but you actually are about to witness an absolute live show. And what I mean by that is anything can happen up here. So, hold on to your hats, please. Here's what happened. At the end of last year, we were all at Highway 21, and Kevin and I were walking out the door, and Joel came up to us and basically kind of cracked a joke about, what did you do you guys at the keynote next year? <laughs> we looked at each other. And we were like, yeah, sure. And I said, sure, Joel, as long as you can get us a fog machine with some kind of the fog will break. Just let us know when that happens, and we'll be ready to go. Walked out the door. We didn't think twice about it. And then a few months ago, Joel hit us up. I was kind of like, hey, so how's it going to keynote? <laughs> Um, really well. All right, we better get a team together. So what we did was we started looking around for a group of folks um, to do a collaborative keynote with us. We were willing to basically come right out of the edge and have a live conversation here this morning. We look for people from all across the district in all different types of roles. And the team that you see here in front of you is the team that we came up with. Um, we're super excited and super proud to be up here with the folks that are up here. We all feel like we don't deserve to be on the stage with everyone else that's up here. And so it's been a lot of fun getting this ready, although, that being said, this is the first time we've all been together to practice. So, <laughs> let's hope that it all goes really, really, really well. And we do have a plan, don't worry. We have met multiple times. But I'm going to kind of let Kevin explain to you a little bit about how this is going to work because it is just a little bit different. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Um, I know that we were your second best option since NPR is on a fun drive right now. So. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was listening to that this morning, and it's like, man, oh man, I guess this is the perfect time for a conference, right? Because I'm going to be sitting there getting new, but I won't find out about how much funds they raise. So what we have here is, we decided, we went uh, we went all across the board with all the things that we wanted to try to do. And as a matter of fact, I think in adding up the hour we're trying to put this together, we decided it might have been easier. You know, it was just Chris doing the keynote, and I'm going to get it done in less time. But uh, <laughs> it will be easier. But what we decided to do is we're going to do this like a panel. But this is a, it's going to be like a panel discussion, but it's going to be slightly different. Uh, most panels, people come up, they might know the questions in advance, but the difference we like to say is that we are prepared. So what we have here is that we've gone through and we do our slides and we talk through each of the slides so we know what everyone's talking about and we know how to speak to them. But the thing that is going to happen is our friend Nate here, he is our mix master. So what he's going to do is have a DJ and he's going to just be throwing up the slides based on what our conversation is and we're going to be speaking to it. It's going to be better than whose line is it anyway, but Glenn did manage to get us a bell in case someone goes off the path. <laughs> I guess that's for me. So what I'm going to tell everybody is to ask you guys, please, as, you, uh, as, as we do this, you're going to see that there's going to be questions that flash up on the screen. You are more than welcome to take the conversation. I'm going to be kind of back along uh, in all of our social media outlets, uh, Twitter, Instagram, any of those things. Uh, pictures of me all have to be above the neck because of my story. And then, uh, <laughs> other, than, other than that, um, we do ask that if you do use, if you do use social media, please do use the hashtag. Um, and it's kind of good shout out to people who have uh, things, uh, you know, that they bring up in the conversation on or uh, on the back channel. Remember, one of the things that we're shooting for here is we know our theme is the local landscape innovation. So what we have with us here today, we have uh, three administrators, you know, we have four teachers in my phone here. Uh, between us, we have, uh, I don't know how many years of experience. One billion years. One billion years. <laughs> that might be an hyperbole. hyperbole. It's the greatest thing ever. And so, Glenn, but I do want to say we have a, it's an administrator of our high school. We have an administrator who started our own school. We have high school. We have elementary. We have everybody is represented. And we want to make sure that when we talk about innovation, we're trying to meet your needs. We're trying to make sure that there's something that you hear that maybe you can click. And so our motivation for you today is just remember, as we talk about innovation, we're talking about innovation it comes from these questions, which is what gets us to great ideas. But uh, for me, we're not going to move on. We're going to talk about questions. Our first question today, our first question today, you see up here on the screen, <laughs> is where does innovation start? And so uh, this is not this is not me being I'm going to start here with uh, my good friend Kelly. Hey, so um, I think a lot of times as educators, when we talk about we talk about it in terms of the wrong focus. And I feel like the focus is often on, you know, what layers can we add to already existing systems? So, so what can we do when we talk in terms of standards or testing or, you know, and, and so we come up with these innovative ideas like putting a test on a computer, which is not innovation, my friends. So 
education starts is with students who have names. And I mentioned that they have names, which is kind of a funny thing, but I mentioned they have names because so often when we talk about innovation or when we talk about education reform, we talk in terms of students kind of globally, as if they're all the same and we can just have this global solution. And I think it's really important that we change our mindsets a little bit and really start to think about uh, innovation in terms of specific students who have names and with those names come stories. And that's where innovation lies when we're looking at the heart of students. So as we talk about innovation up here, I just encourage you that you pull out students in your own mind um, who are waiting for innovation and who are looking to do for that. So um, with that in mind, where, where does innovation start for you? Where did it start for you? You know, for me, it kind of came along the same lines as kind of talked about. Um, the idea that we are teachers who teach students, um, a lot of times we kind of have this idea that we need to be employable teachers, which is true, and we need to just do the right things all the time. But sometimes we, we get confused or we get lost in our own job sometimes and forget that what we're doing really does impact a lot of students. We see our students every day. Um, if you're a high school teacher, you see a lot more students every day. Um, but that doesn't make what we do any less real. And so I like this quote that is, that's up on the board right now. It's really focusing on the fact that, yes, we are employed by these schools, we are employed by these districts, but really what it comes down to is we need to work for our students. And like Kelly was mentioning earlier, if we're paying attention to their names, if we're, we're paying attention to the stories that they bring to our classroom, how can we really transform our classroom to benefit all of the students that we have in our classes? Once we start to kind of shift that a little bit, then we're able to really think about where does that innovation start with those students. Liz, you want to chime in there? Um, I want to introduce you also to introduce yourself. So, <laughs> 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 so I'm Nate, and I'm in Heritage High School. Sorry, thanks, Liz. Um, so I'm Nate, and I'm in Heritage High School. I'm 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 Heritage High School. I
basically, I could get that, but you know, it's a horrible, it's not, not fair to them, but our goal was to ultimately to educate every child. And so even though I didn't know what I was doing, my innovation started with just computers, right? I said, this is a way that I can actually solve a few issues. That was, I didn't know what blended learning was, I didn't know what any of that stuff was. As a matter of fact, I had only been using computers for a couple of years for myself in the profession. And so for me, I was forced out of it. I asked myself a question and then I had to come up with an idea. Yeah, so the question about where to start for me, and by the way, I'm going on this. Uh, I do stuff with things on computers. Um, uh, I'm a principal, I'm headed to a new job at charter school. You ready for, for this title? I don't know how to make fit on the business card. It's director of curriculum instruction and innovation. Um, I'm probably not going to use the back side of the part. Um, it will be very into the back set of cards uh, regardless. So what I want to talk about was uh, you know, where innovation started for me. And for me, it, it started from a place of anger and frustration, um, which isn't the healthiest place for things to start, not a very healthy place to stay, but I stayed there for a really long time. So I was at Kelly School maybe two, three months ago, and they had this wonderful uh, art display up, and it was based around a quote saying, obviously, you can jump up butcher to death. Um, but basically, it's, it's the idea of you know, change or hope has two beautiful daughters, right? The first daughter is anger, and that anger is about seeing the world the way it is and not being the way that you want it to be. And then the second beautiful daughter is courage to change things, right? And that resonated so well with me. And it actually made me feel like I gave up being as angry as I did for a long time. Um, you know, and then, and then as I got to thinking about this, the, the thing that I think about a lot is where, where does innovation come from? And a lot of times, if not always, it's innovation comes from unhealthy systems, right? When systems aren't healthy, when they can't adapt, when they can't change, when they're not flexible, that's when innovation happens. Healthy systems adapt, right? That, that's how we work out here today. You know, a healthy system for a really long time. Um, and we adapt. Unhealthy systems have to innovate to survive, or they have to innovate to fall, just put right on. So, so we sort of have to think, we, we have a choice, right? Either, either we can adapt and change and do it in healthy ways, or we can be like, if you know, some of those examples are awesome, um, you know, there's some examples of, of systems that do not adapt in that innovation space at all. Anyone seen a blockbuster movie recently? No blockbuster. Um, you know, and, and the nice change on that, I would say that Netflix, but the real truth is, is the pilot that they killed Blockbuster. Right? In 20 minutes, you can have any movie that you want with no commercials, no having to skip any DVDs. You might have to break some laws, but you know. <laughs> right? And there it goes. Right? And there's some other examples out there as well. But again, I want to come back to this idea that innovation comes from unhealthy systems. So do we truly need to innovate or can I think it was vastly uh, overqualified for the job at least. Yeah. I think I'm pretty So, my name is Chris Moore. I'm, uh, I used to be a teacher every day, and I couldn't be happier about it. Innovation for me, uh, you have a little bit of time. <clears throat> and if you've ever you know, been in a session or been in your many, if I knew that you were an educator, you were in any level of opportunity whatsoever, I definitely mentioned this little bit of time. The little bit of time was the day that I learned about audience and purpose for my students in their work. It was the day that my students wanted to work more, so much more than I knew how to make them on my own. Once my students found an audience and purpose for their work, they wanted to write all of the time. So I did it in the middle of a science lesson and they'd be begging me to write more. Do you guys have that problem with me? It was driving me crazy, I didn't know what to do. Uh, but it was all because, basically, back when we started with that, we didn't have Google Apps, we had, we had water. That was because of my gateway drug. We had little uh, trickling netbooks and they were open source, so we didn't have a whole lot of great you know, software or anything like that. But what we did have was a blunder, and so we got this business online. And we put, I was just like a little kid with that one, right? I've got a piece of junk widget thing up there. It was the least most horrific. But I learned it a lot. And the students learned that somebody cared about their work who wasn't their mommy, who wasn't their teacher. As we started to get an audience and a purpose for our work, the work that the students were doing, it literally went to the roof. I didn't know what to do a lot of the time. And that was when I learned another really important lesson, which was just basically how to get out of that way sometimes. You know, as teachers, we like to control things a lot and have things are really a lot. Um, but when you really start to innovate with technology, excuse me, and it's in your life, and your students really have access to it all the time, you really are, are forced to make a decision, which is, am I going to revolt against this, or am I going to change with it? And if I change with it, what's going to happen? And what happened for me was, 
I learned that I had to kind of strike them down a path and give them some assistance, and sometimes I got to be the leader, and sometimes they got to be the leader. But all of the time, we were all learning together, and it was because we had a reason, a purpose. We were going to put that work somewhere, and somebody was going to see it, and they were going to have an opinion about it, and that motivated us to do more and to do better. And so for me, that's kind of where it began. So I'm just going to mention this. Uh, there's a tweeter in the audience, then a word, at then a word. It's asked a question for the panel, so actually, guys, it's, it's your time now. Here's where it goes wrong. So, what advice do you have for working with and around peers who resist innovation? So again, what advice do you have for working with and around peers who resist innovation? <laughs> That's our worst next time word. Yes. Um, so this is a this is a hard one for me because I worked in a school where there wasn't this great resistance for innovation and for doing things differently because it's worked for the last thirty years. Why would we change it? And I think, again, I, you know, I did various things to try and, and get people excited, so I would do these Westpiration Wednesdays, we call them, and we watch TED Talks together or lunch, and, um, and to some degree it was helpful and helped people kind of reframe a little bit. But I think the biggest um, kind of light bulb moment for me, that it wasn't my job to change my peers, was to realize that not everyone sees what I see, and not everyone's in the spot that I was in. And that my students were relying on me. Um, and there's this weird sense of urgency in education to get it right because kids keep growing. Right? They don't wait for us to like figure this out. And so for me, it wasn't, I wasn't going to wait for my peers to kind of come around. And I did what I could in the space I was in. Um, but there was this turning point where it, I saw something that others couldn't see, and I wasn't willing to just sit on it. And so that's what led to me starting a school five years ago. Is, so I think, um, you know, that might not be the answer you want to hear, you know, you just wave this magic wand and kind of change everyone, but I think that that um, kind of movement is contagious, and I think that that makes people um, look at things differently and kind of consider things differently. The school that I left um, is a completely different landscape now, and I think a lot of that just has to do with kind of being shut off with, okay, now we've got this different scenario happening, and, um, and this different way of looking at so I think just in your own space, when you are innovative, it's naturally going to draw curiosity from your peers. And it may not be this overnight change, but it's completely because it doesn't kind of lend itself to, to change. And I think that that's, that's so brilliant. And add to that, I think, is showing what the kids can do when you get out of their way when you give them big things to wrestle with, when you give them some, some time and some opportunity and encouragement, the amazing things that, that the kids in our program are doing are just phenomenal. And people see that and they're like, wait a minute, what, how, how do we do this? You know, we were trying to draw up support initially. Who wants to be part of this? Who wants to be part of this? We've got three of our high schools on board with our program. Yeah, we're going to do kids with an independent study for a year on one question one big question. And they're going to work on that question for a year, try to answer it for themselves, try to interview people out in the community, see what their answers are, and then come up with a product to persuade people that their answer matters and that action needs to happen because of it. So we got three takers from our nine high schools. This next year, after we showed in one meeting, in two hours, what our kids were doing, we immediately had another school who was like, oh, wait a minute. We, we want it. We want it. So I think also it's us telling the story, but it's the kids acting differently about learning <coughs> that makes people want to have their kids act like that. So just to add on to it, I think having the kids inspire and motivate the need to innovate is, is huge. So completely agree with both of you guys. Another couple of my thoughts that I've been thinking really deeply about in terms of helping people innovate and um, supporting that work is you have to be kind. Um, that seems like a no-brainer, but it's, it's very true. So being kind, being supportive, listening to concerns, um, maybe not necessarily validating, but listening and being a sounding board for, for why, why, why are you not interested in innovating, asking lots of questions of people, showing them examples of innovation that's happening that, that are inspiring. So I think being kind in 
inspiring and supporting folks throughout that process is, is a huge part of, of really resistant folks along the way. So the kids and their work will speak for themselves as a peer or um, someone in leadership, I think, being kind, showing that you also are courageous and being supportive of the aspects to help them with that. I just wanted to add on with that, that there's a huge amount of your innovating um, that you need to have grace for yourself and others. And I feel like you're, you're risk taking, you're kind of stepping out into this unknown area. And um, all of these grand ideas that you have and all of these, these plans that you have sometimes work out really great and sometimes they crash and burn miserably. And so there does have to be that sense of kindness and grace even for yourself in that moment that it's okay and we can move on and we're all resilient. And, and I feel like that's something we don't do a lot of in our society. We want to get it right the first time. And so allowing ourselves those moments of grace and extending that to others as well, that we will always get it right the first time. The first time. Well, one last thing I want to do is um, I think part of it is finding a friend. Right. Like, I have been extremely fortunate, and I realize that it's been a blessing to get every single thing that I've had I've loved. And I know that doesn't happen for everybody. So, um, but there are ways to find friends, you know, that maybe are not next door to you or right on the hall of you. And speaking like this, where would you do that? You know, finding a place where you can find a friend who maybe is in a different school or is in a different district. Or maybe they live in a different state, or maybe they live in a different country, or maybe they live all the way on the other side of the world. Who cares? Right? We have these things like Skype and Hangouts and email and Gmail and Snail mail. We have ways to be connected to people who are like it. And I think that having that connection helps you make it through those rough times. When the people around you, you know, maybe aren't seeing all the time what you're doing or you're not able to move people or students forward as quickly as you'd like to. It's nice to have a friend to kind of go to and be like, ah, you know, and then work through it and laugh about it. And part of that, you know, building that ability to have failure in yourself and kind of celebrate it, hopefully will transfer to your classroom. Where it's maybe the most beneficial lesson you could ever teach a student, right? I would say probably more than any content is the that, you know, I think some of the buzzwords are called maybe your grit, right? I want my students to be not only comfortable with failures, but recognizing it as a step toward success. I want to celebrate those failures whenever we can. And so I think that goes a long way for working with the people around you who make their challenging with you. I would also add that uh, if I'm trying to reach out to my peers, I think you have to do it with a certain amount of attention. And so I want you guys to be considering like anything that I do, uh, I, I mean, I'm constantly trying to be as I say, tell me that Halloween didn't know what he was getting into. So, in any event, I think intentionality is key, right? Coming up, you know, having a plan, making sure you know how to reach out to people. A great way, I think, to actually support your, your folks who are resistant or whatnot is to actually start a design process. If you're not familiar with Stanford EU and they have a great design process uh, that they use, um, actually, they're going to use, I think we should start with empathy. And so, really, if you start with empathy, and this is, I, anyone know who this guy is up here in this line? This is my superintendent, Donald Trump, over, and he's got a wonderful empathy face. But the idea is, <laughs> I want you to it is very, it's very, uh, it's, it's, look at it, but it feels like feelings, it feels like it. And so, what I want you guys to be thinking, empathy is actually where it all starts. It's not about my decision that I'm going to force on you, right? It's not about what I want you to do. What it's about is finding out how I can support you, what it is that it will take to help you get through this next stage. And so if you're not familiar with design thinking, I know there's a few sessions that reference it throughout the day, but it's a great way to make sure that you're not only coming up with real solutions to real problems, being able to define specifically what the problem is, but then in addition to that, it gives you those opportunities to actually kind of like rapidly prototype solutions to these problems. And so I suggest, you know, anyone who's really trying to reach out and do this kind of work, start there. It means, I don't think you can go wrong. Now, unless there's anybody else who has anything else to add on this, I think we have one more question. Yeah, just very quickly, but I'm so glad to hear kindness and empathy come up in this conversation. The level of arrogance in education technology is amazing. Um, and if you want to turn people off from doing something new and innovative quickly, just, just look down your nose at them. Tell, tell them how great you are. Come up in my sessions. But I'm also so happy to hear, you know, and another thing that came up was just in mind, you know, in Zen there's this idea of direct wanting, right? We can tell people all day long, this is what we do, this is how we do it. But if you can just show them, and just show them over and over and over and over again, it's the best way to do it. So we have another question come in. Uh, again, we're, we're just going to stay off the uh, rails for a minute here. Uh, Brandon uh, Peterson, right over there, I don't know if there is a uh, He asked, 
question. Uh, many may say you need money to innovate. So this is all about the case. And so money to innovate, do you all believe that to be true? How can we help friends to practically innovate? I'll just keep talking. Um, so I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the edgy punk movement, right? But it's this idea that like, we just do it ourselves. And, and every single thing, like, almost every single thing you've ever had, we have it before, right? It's not like, oh, okay, that's a great idea, I'm going to throw a bunch of money in it. Like, we look for a problem, we try and solve a problem, we do it right inside of our classroom, we, we do that every single day. So money, money I mean, money's not just something you're wrong, but that's not the fair. Money, money's not the fair to do something. You know, do it yourself, do it cheap, do it quick, do it dirty. Right? Just, just make it happen. Completely agree. Why is that money is necessary? Um, when I started this school, finally, I was like, oh, I started it without being young. I was like, I started it without any grants. I started it with zero dollars. Right? And so I started it But at the same time, how can we think about our 
our classes and what we do in a way that's going to engage our students on a daily basis. Innovation is one of those ways that we can do it. Uh, I want to kind of move the discussion along a little bit too. I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of a surprise that I had when I started innovating. I think we can all kind of agree that there just came this point where we're just like, okay, I'm on the edge. I just need to jump off. I just need to do it. And, and I think that there is a sense of courageousness and fear about jumping off the edge. But I'd be interested to see what you guys all have to say about what are some of the surprises that you came across when you did take that leap, when you just went for it. I was really surprised, and maybe I should have been, but I was shocked by how hard it was for our kids and our teacher leaders and our principals who are working with this program to study deeply one question for a year. So I can't tell you the number of times we go in and we meet with them, and they'd be like, wait a minute, oh, let me tell you first of all what the question was, because you'll get it, and then, then you'll join me in being shocked. So the question is, what are the knowledge and skills people need to be successful in a global society? And that was kind of their research question. They had to figure out what they thought about that, what their answer was, because I didn't have an answer for it. So what are the knowledge and skills people need to be successful in a global society? So we've been in this for two, three months now, right? Give me an item, we go and we meet with the team leaders. And they're like, okay, so what's the question you're talking about again? We're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah. I, so we're yeah. supposed to be doing. Right. Um, wait. The question is, is what and and what are we supposed to do with it? You're supposed to find your answer to that. Okay. And then we go and we meet with kids and they'd be like, so this this question. What do you want us to do with that? And I'm like, no, no, no. It's not what we want you to do with that. What do you think the answer is? So I guess all we want you to do is, is figure out what you think the answer is. And I think it was pretty surprising. It was surprising. Um, well, yes and no. I think anytime you switch your outcomes and what you want to have happen from very concrete, very measurable, very creativeless, yes, no, those kind of outcomes to big, broad, ambiguous, open-ended outcomes, it's a struggle because we've existed in that paradigm for so long to where we had very clear outcomes, clear cut expectations. And so to have this big ambiguous question and outcome around there's not one right way to do it, there's multiple answers across the board, is really a struggle. Um, and it comes out of a desire to, to be achieving and to do the right thing and to find the right answers. Um, but having that big amb ambiguous open question. Um, we were a little bit surprised that it was it was as difficult as it was. So that was that was something that was a bit shocking. Something that I found surprising is the only one who uh, was really burdened by me innovating was me, right? And so uh, and so ultimately, I've been a lot of extra work on my end, right? And that's fine. It's all back at work. I was afraid students were going to go mad, they were going to go crazy, they weren't going to be able to handle stuff. I mean, how many of you guys have ever thought what the good the question I always thought when I first started putting computers in front of my students was. Um, how, how will I know what internet page they're on? How many ever thought of that? Well, how do, I, how do I know? And then I came to the realization that it's the same, the same way I know what textbook page they're on. And it was just by being around them, right? And so when my, computer, when my computers were allowing me to walk around the room more and to not be doing much during instruction, the truth was is that I knew that I had to take my medicine, right? We're in a sixth system from this point, and I knew that there were things that were wrong. There was no reason for me to have to be teaching 43 kids at that time. But the reality was, as a social studies teacher, and I needed a job. And so I was like, I will do anything. I remember even being in my principal's office when they said, you know, are you going to be okay with this? And they said, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm a yes man. I'll do whatever. You know, you can back up whatever, as long as you're going to a job. And so uh, for me, there was, a, there was definitely a problem. Um, but I decided to innovate, and the kids ate it up. And I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to free riff here for a second. I had, uh, I had an issue, and there's a few people who probably heard this story already, but I had an issue with a class where I taught them about South America for, I don't know, uh, several weeks, and we did an assessment, and all of these failed. And then when I looked back over, I realized that they were having a hard time keeping 
country street. So I went back over the next day, I gave me a test, uh, just a map test. So I got to be not supposed to do that, I guess, but I said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to see what you guys remember since we've studied these countries for so long. And 100% of my kids got low, like 10, 15% on identifying 13 different countries. And so the reality was, I said, there's got to be an easier way to how I used to study. I used to study by, and actually you guys are talking about this, I used to study by filling in a map and looking at it for a long time, and then just listening to the words. And so uh, I, ended up, I ended up going into the Google, and I typed in free mapping game, and then I found about 100 different things, and I started looking up. And uh, I found this thing called Shepherd Software, and that was what got me hooked. That was, that was my, by the way, my gateway drug, I think, that I that out. And, uh, uh, my thing is, is that when I had my kids go down and do it, I just said that we just got to play level one to get to 100% so we can now go back over and reteach this stuff. So yeah, this is the time where we have to check out the library media center. And so I went down there and I checked out the center and the kids went in and it was totally gamified. And so when kids got to level one, at 100% they started asking me, can, can I go level two now? Can I go level three? And so, you know, it wasn't a big deal, it was 13 countries, but they knew it, they were excited. So the next time I taught, uh, like when I was going to teach Europe, if you can imagine Europe, there's like 54 countries and like a few microstates. I needed them to actually have contacts, like where, you know, where's Liechtenstein? And so when I brought them in to do that, within one hour, 100% of my kids didn't matter, they didn't care for it as much, it didn't matter. <coughs> They came in, they had 100% proficiency, they were moving up, playing these games, they were so excited. And all I had to do was put in a little extra elbow grease before we went down, and what was that, checking out a lab, making sure I had a plan, and all those are things that I had to do. And so for me, the biggest surprise was, it was only hard for me, the kids ate it up. Hey, Kevin, I have sort of had a different experience, so I want to share a story from my second year of teaching. I was teaching civics to seniors, a full year of all course required for graduation. I'm in my second year of teaching, and I decided that the way that civics is being taught did not have enough connection to, you know, being an active person in the democracy. And so I decided to teach the whole class using Socratic seminar, no tests. And the, the way that children are going to show their understanding of what we talked about is more or less through direct action. Um, I freaked out students and parents, and, and I got to meet my superintendent in my second year. Right. But the, the, good, the good news is I found out it's really, really hard to get fired as a teacher. That's good. Uh, and then I spent the next 13 years trying to get fired. Uh, but where I'm going with this is that you know, if you're going to take, do something, I'll say radical, even though I'm not sure that it was so radical, you've got to take the time to build trust. Right? You've got, you've got to let your students know that they can trust you, that you can trust them. And then stage two on that is letting your parents know that, that it's safe. Right? It's a safe place. A lot of people talk about the value of failure um, in education, which is something I disagree with the whole part of um, Because if we're going to play the we need to fail to learn game, then we need to make sure that failure is something safe. Right? Because right now, failure is something that is not safe. Right? Because it's not safe for graduation, you on track. So we've got to make sure that, that failing, finally we're going to make failing only, because right now for other reasons it's not another thing. Uh, and so that, that, that's a bit of my, my innovation story, is just take, take those risks, you know, be afraid, be uncomfortable, because you're going to be uncomfortable, that, that's just part of it. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, and try to have some fun. Have, have fun with your kids, have fun with yourself. Uh, because we don't get paid enough to come in and slog through on many days. Right? We should be tired this time, that part makes all sense in the world to me, but to come in every day and see 150 young people with bright, bright futures, unlimited potential, and not just have a good time doing that, uh, that's, that's, maybe that's the big practice I'm looking for, is, is just having a good time with young people and helping them self act. I think one of, just based on what you're talking about, one of the things that really surprised me about motivation is not everyone will think that you're as brilliant as you do. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, I think that I, you, you do all of these really cool things and you're seeing this change and growth and this amazing energy from your students. And there will still be people who don't think what you're doing is good. And they don't get it. And, um, and that's hard. And I didn't expect that um, to be the case. And I think, you know, it's so easy to look at companies like Apple and think, oh, you know, they're universally loved. Um, 
they're not being personally loved either. Not everyone made that was broken. Um, that, that was hard for me because we live in a society where a day means that you did a good job. And, and we're really looking for that kind of validation from your peers, from parents, from all of these different places. And, um, and one of the hardest parts for me has been um, seeing the amazing growth, the amazing change in a student, just seeing them come back to life um, and be really excited about education and energized and having a parent come and say, well, yeah, that was great. And for me, that's so defeating. And I'm like, do you get it? You know, I just want to show you, do you get it? Um, there's so much more here than a grade than, than what you see. So um, I think that was the biggest surprise for me is just not everyone is going to see it the way that you see it. Standards and stuff in my life, I see two sides of the standards debate. I'm not trying to really go there, but when my kids are asking me, what do I have to be a four or whatever? What the real definition to me, the real definition is to me in my own life, heart and soul is you have to do something that I didn't even think, I, I couldn't even have dreamt of for you in the first place. Like when you actually exceed my expectations of you, not as a fifth grader, but as just a human being, that's when you've earned the four. Right? It's when you do something that I didn't even have the brains to dream of myself. They are capable, every single one of them, and every single one of you, and every single one of us, are capable of exceeding each other's expectations in ways that are just astounding. If you just pay attention, right? You've all seen it before. I'm sure that you have. Some kid or some teacher or somebody around you you work with or know did something that you just would never have ever even come up with and was so amazing to you. That's a four. That's what we're trying to do. And in order to do that, you take some risks. And you have to realize that most of the robots um, are self-imposed, right? We do this to ourselves. We find ways to stop ourselves from taking risks. We're very, 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 very good at it. And we model it for our students all of the time. And that's why they're being very, very, very good at it. So, to me, it's very much about letting them take risks and earn their students. And, and letting them see it. And letting them see what you do when it goes really, really well. And let them see what you do when it doesn't go really, really well. Because Lord knows they need that model for us. By us, by our families, by our community, by everyone around them. Uh, which also means they need the opportunity to do that for themselves. And if we control everything they do, uh, that's not going to happen. We need to be nice. that some of the best things that have happened to us in this world have been absolutely safe. Right? You've all heard a lot of these examples close to this, right? This guy was trying to invent like the world's greatest super group. You're doing the perfect thing that doesn't stick to that level. Right? <laughs> chocolate chip cookies, the lady ran out of time. She was supposed to melt the chocolate chips first and mix it up and make these chocolate cookies. But she didn't have time, so she just threw the chips in and baked it and boom. Chocolate chip cookies. Right. So, all of these things are like some million examples like this, right? Where people have just kind of maybe veered off of like they did an accident where it you know, was like a group of beautiful hoops. And we do that all the time in the classroom. And if we take the time to realize and recognize it, our students will learn things. So, uh, we have a couple of questions that are coming in, so I want to make sure that uh, uh, we get a chance to answer them. Um, <clears throat> this one's from Ben Wilcock of the panel. How has your learning process changed as a result of your innovation? So, how has your learning process changed as a result of your innovation? I'm going to just say a quick thing. Um, for me, uh, the first time I went rock climbing, uh, I actually fell off the edge. I was roped in, <laughs> but I actually fell off of the edge. I, so, so your biggest fear happened the first time, right? Now, granted, with some bruising and some wicked cool scars, I had a nice raspberry on my arm. The, the reality was that's kind of how I thought my learning process has changed, right? It kind of worked the same way. My time in innovation is a lot like a, a, those old black and white movies where the guy drops his hat and reaches for it and tries to grab it and kicks it a little further. And that's kind of what it is. I've been very, been very serendipitous, and that's kind of how my learning process is going. I'm not afraid of going through the quick path. I'm not afraid of trying things. But I also know that for me, I had to actually accept I'm going to try things and they're not going to work. And I'm going to have, and, and it was, it was letting my kids know I'm going to try things and it's not going to work, right? And it was letting the other teachers know, and even more so my administrator. And so usually when I do, I was going to try something even more wild or whatever. I would say, you know, hey, if you want to come in for this, that's cool, but I think it's an evaluation time or something. I'm still going to try this because we're not going to, you know, change the product or whatever it is that we're going to do. But for me, my own process is a change that I was thinking, it's okay. Go experiment, go learn, go try, and then see what learning comes from trying. I think for me, to the, uh, 
to go back to Kevin's uh, idea from earlier about the design thinking process, uh, one of the things that's changed in my own learning and my own education is the fact that if something hasn't worked, well, I try. And now I can start again and try and change one tiny little thing. You know? Um, after I try that one tiny little thing, see if it works or not. And just this, I, this process of trying, and failing, and then changing. Just iterating in different ways and kind of just doing the cycle until I find something that does work. A couple of people have mentioned that idea of it being kind of a gateway drug that got you into innovation or what was that mean point? I think for me, and Ben, I love this question, by the way. Of course, I love it. Ben's, Ben's great. Um, for me, I think the thing that it's done and how it's impacted my learning is it's it's the scale of which my money has increased is exponential. So much to the chagrin of my husband, I spend a lot of time when I'm not at work or working learning because I'm so engaged and so passionate about finding out what are other people doing, how can I learn from others, what other things do I see happening. So I've become kind of an addict to innovation and innovative thinking and teaching and learning practices. Um, some of which I probably need to rein in for the benefit of my personal life at some point in time. But it really has changed the way that I think about teaching and learning that my own growth and development is not confined to certain times of days. It's an ongoing process that, um, fortunately, there's always additional opportunities to learn and grow. Well, and I think part of what you're responding to is that it's fun. It's so it's like you, like yeah. you mentioned. It's fun. It makes what we do, which is really, really hard, fun. And I think that's what I'm noticing with our kids, too. The learning is in the sweet spot. It's really hard, and yet it's really fun. And that's, that's a, a beautiful combination that I think makes our kids excited about doing big work. And I think that they're really made for that. My, one of my ahas this year has been that my kids don't really need me so much to be helping them with the what. They're going to go out and discover the what. They have lots of places to find the what. And they don't even necessarily need me to help them with the how. They need me to reflect what they're thinking and help them think better. And I think, well, that's the coolest job that a person could possibly have on this planet, is to help other people think better and to help them realize what they're thinking. Thank you for that question. How does my learning process change is a really simple answer. I learned that I'm much more of a social worker than I thought I was. I do all of my best learning socially now, whether it's you know on a social network or whether it's face to face, it's usually bringing face to face. But I learn more about myself, and so when I really want to learn about something, I go and talk to people about it. And for me, that's a huge revelation about myself. You know, I thought I was a completely different kind of learner. And I would, I'm a test geek, like I love to develop a personality test and all those things. But, um, in, in just reality and experience, I've learned that the truth is, I am socially, for me, that's too Um, I think I grew up um, very good at school. I did very well, I got the straight A's, I had to take tests really well. I think that my gift is multiple choice tests. Um, it's always easy. No. Um, so for me, the, what changed for, in my learning um, was really that there isn't always an answer, and that's okay. And to find the beauty in the question, um, and to really just thrive in that. And I think the beauty in those questions is what it, it is. It becomes this kind of drug. It kind of, you become an addict, and you want to know more. And I think about, um, for my students, I've seen this same process where those who do very well at school and who know, who want all the right answers and are comfortable with the answer, um, it's really uncomfortable when you start questioning. And there maybe isn't just one answer or one right answer. Usually there isn't. And so I liken it for my students to pushing a snowball, a big snowball up a hill. And learning is really hard sometimes. And you don't know where the top of that hill is. And you're pushing and you're pushing. And you want to give up. And you want to say, never mind, this is the baby at the top of the hill. But when you get there, you look out and there's this beauty. And then you can push it down the other side and suddenly it gains momentum. It's all of this. And so the first time that kids experience that we made it to the top and now there's just momentum, it's this amazing, incredible experience. And it's the same for teachers, I think. It's the same for all of us. There's just this beauty and humanity and the nuances of who we are as people. And 
success and that um, just the beauty of those questions, I feel like that's been that momentum picks up and then they're like, yes, that hard part is worth all of this other stuff. Um, before they get to that point, it really is hard. And there are times that we all think about and say, it must, there must be an easier way, there must be an easier answer to this um, than I'm thinking of. But, but that beauty of those questions, I think, is the big, it has been the biggest thing. So I do have another question here from, uh, this is again coming from the Twitter sphere. Uh, this one is from Noah Geisel, uh, and this one is a new one, right? guys. So, uh, so we're going to start, I'm going to have a piece of clarification, then I have a start of an answer. Uh, Noah Geisel asked the question, so what is the local landscape? Um, how are we doing? Are we adapting for needing innovation? So I do want to make one quick mention, and this is a shout out. Uh, Chris and I uh, were trying to think of a theme for this, this uh, keynote. And so when we were sitting down and talking, uh, luckily his wife was eavesdropping. And she's smarter than both of us. I think there's something wrong with, with like our frontal lobes or something like that. In any event, she sat down and she said, you know, the thing is, is that people most likely don't want to hear about one guy who did one thing. They probably want to hear about what folks are doing out there nearby, right? And so we thought we would go with this concept of the local landscape of the innovation, which again is for our idea. <laughs> but it's pretty great because what we're thinking about is in the end, I don't think any of us here like started as presenters or started doing any of this kind of work. We all started in the classroom, right? And so when you think about where this came from, like this is I don't want to sound like a <laughs> but the local landscape of innovation is in this room, right? You are the ones that are trying to do things better and trying to do things, you know, to improve the life of your students. You know that you're gonna have to put in that extra work and do those extra things. Um, but in addition, through, throughout, there's going to be all sorts of pockets, all up and down the front range. When I was looking for, I mean, and this is, again, in the Ben's question earlier, you know, for me to learn, I actually went to other people, right? There's times when we, you know, in our more competitive society, especially when we look at education, where it's tempting to not always show off our playbook, not always show people what makes us unique and what makes us interesting and what makes our classes work, right? But, for me, I think that we have an obligation, right? And I think, for me, I can go into all of these different schools. If I say I'm looking for someone who has something with different spaces, I want to go, I have teachers that want to go, I can put something out on Twitter and I'll probably get like 100 responses. For me, I think that the examples are everywhere. I don't think it's done, but I also don't think it's ever done. For me, when I think about innovation, I think about innovation, I think about Mario Brothers. And so, uh, the thing is, this thing is how it and whatnot. Mario runs through and then he gets to the flag, but what happens when he's done? He, he goes to World 2. And then he goes to World 2 and he gets to the flag and then he goes to World 3. The reality is, is to know his question here is how are we doing? I think we're moving along. I think we're going in a great direction. But I also do think that it's never done. So I think, you know, snapshot of time, I think sometimes for me, I'm right where I need to be. But sometimes I think I really need to do that. Yeah, I think just maybe that happens. What Kevin kind of was saying here is uh, he mentioned Twitter. I mean, we we projected a few tweets up on Twitter. We've been taking some questions through Twitter, but I think for me, what happened was in my first semester of teaching, I realized that my school had a problem. I should say problem. My my school was really good. But the problem is they've been really good for a really long time and they're doing things the same way a lot of the time. Um, and so for me, in my first semester, I attended a conference. I just went to a free conference on a Saturday and I came. And I was like, let's see what's happening out there. And it, it wasn't until like, I showed up at this conference. Luckily, it was my first semester of teaching. But it was in that, that day of learning that I saw, holy cow. There are a lot of people doing amazing things. And there are a lot of people that I can connect with. And it wasn't until I started connecting with people outside of my own little school that I started to be able to see what was truly possible in education. Like I said, my school is great. I love my school. And it's always on those lists of you know, the best schools or whatnot. But I wanted, I wanted to see what else was out there. I didn't want to just be stuck in one place. In one, you know, 
to your point, Noah, I'm not really sure that I know what it's like. I'm not sure that I know what the local landscape is like broadly, because I get the privilege of surrounding myself with wonderful folks who think like I do and who are passionate and moving. And so that, that becomes my world. My world really does become people who want to move, people who want to change, people who are doing cool things. And so I can't say what it looks like everywhere because I think probably I experience a subpopulation um, that is highly motivated to do cool, fun stuff with kids. I hope that that is the broader experience, but it's not. I hope that the people that I get the privilege of hanging out with, that they can help inspire and encourage and make it possible for people who aren't feeling as comfortable yet moving in that direction to do so. I would just say break the bubble, right? If you got something in your comfort zone, go somewhere else, go see somebody else. How many of you have had an incredible learning experience when you went to go visit another classroom? Every man is going to be an error. Anybody who's done that has learned, I hope. Um, for me, part of the deal was, you know, like I said, I'm a social media, so breaking that bubble, finding out what's going on around me. There is absolutely innovation happening all around us in this state, in this country. It's happening. It's, we, the revolution has begun, my friends. But it's not in full swing yet. And part of the reason for that is because we haven't connected to each other well enough. We're just beginning to. For me, when I think about professional development for teachers, which is something I'm getting more and more passionate about as, as, I, as I learn and grow, I think about nachos. But I think about nachos. And um, what I did was I started getting a couple of friends together. And we start to just go hang out and go to, you know, one house and nachos. And it was this incredible learning experience. It was also a lot of fun. And we started doing that more and more often. And what I really need to be in your professional development plan is some nachos friends. Come have nachos with us, okay? But what happened was we started making these friendships, these connections, these relationships, these two-way streets. And so then what happened next was when we weren't sitting with each other having nachos, we were still connected to the hands or websites or Twitter or phone calls or chats or chat texts or whatever it was. But we were more involved with each other, we cared more about each other, and so now when we would throw that question out into the hangout or into the sphere or whatever it was, we would start to get replies. And we would start to want to reply to others because we knew them. We, we knew who they were, we knew about their students, we knew what their situation was, we knew what kind of help they needed, and we knew that maybe we were the one that could help. So when you're thinking about what are your next steps, think about nachos. Find some friends. I cannot tell you how helpful it is. When you're trying to do that with technology, or when you're trying to do that with, you know, getting your kids outside more, whatever it is, just find some friends and then you'll have to go out and miss it. Okay, so this panel, this is Buzz Around, I guess, since we are now in our last few minutes of the presentation. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we kind of covered was this concept of time you know we'll get your innovation and your current innovation is successful. So, the question we have how do we know if our innovation is successful? And I'm going to start just by saying, you know, first and foremost for me, it has to do with uh, what I was saying earlier, it has to do with the process. I know that the success for me comes from testing, iterating, you know, going back over, trying again, trying again, knowing it's never done, knowing that Mario always gets around to, and knowing that we always have to continue to work to innovate. But for me, it also is about my end user, right? I can talk about achievement, but then if I talk about my student's achievement, I also need to make sure that I'm giving full credit to the people who talked before me. Right? Those guys filled more gaps than I could have in that one year. I also know that when, if, if I refer to you, those things are the things that are looked at, you know, uh, I can say I'm a bureaucrat, so. But <laughs> those, it's looked at by bureaucrats that choose to evaluate, that's not what I think it is. For me, I think my innovation is successful when my attendance goes up, when my students start asking me questions. I know it's successful when students come in voluntarily on lunch to continue working on projects. I know all of those things are my indicators. Sure, they're anecdotal, but I'm also just so that way that I have my first to do a survey every year. And I would start the year telling my students, I'm going to try new things, and you're going to have to tell me what I need to fix. And so even though I'm no longer teaching, when I was in the classroom my last year's uh, survey, 
communicates not only that I feel I had stronger relationships, but the feedback is consistently about how much they enjoy their relationship with me, speaking with me, things that they have to do with me. And so who, did, who, who would have known? I, you know, I didn't think my wife would agree that being around me was somehow uh, so rewarding. Uh, but, uh, but in the end, my success rate is the happiest of kids. Kevin, I love you, but you're so bad at life now. I'm going to just try to say, uh, as teachers, we know that we make a lot of impact on students, and sometimes we don't see that impact until 25 years down the road. Um, when you start to change things up in your classroom, and you'll we'll see some of those um, experiences change, and you'll see that impact a little bit sooner, I think. I would just say that the genius is unleashed, and when you're alumni, I think for us, I'm not like happy. I mean, we so it's nice to have a together. I think, I think for me, and you can speak for you, um, that it's when we are excited about the work that we're doing collaboratively. The kids, the principals, the teachers, us, when we're all excited about what we're doing. And we won't be excited every minute, I know that, because generally there's that excitedness. That and kids being so proud of their work, watching kids shine, watching them present to big audiences, and just being so proud of their learning, and so proud that they've had an impact and do big things. Um, that they matter, every kid matters, and every kid can have a big impact in a very big way. So watching students be really proud of their learning and watching, um, watching them change things is, I think, a huge measure of success. Watching stakeholders go, whoa. Oh, all right. So, our final question for y'all is this. 